have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. We know the air is unfit to breathe and our food is unfit to eat, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. We know things are bad, worse than bad. They're crazy. Say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. You have meddled with the primal forces of nature. Don't give yourselves to brutes. Men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think, or what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder. Don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men, with machine minds and machine hearts. Jason Burmes. And who loves you? And who do you love? And we are live. Look, I know you're still looking at a thumbnail with a badly <laughs> misspelled automating. And yesterday I had three years on it. We're going by the fly, uh, the uh, the seat of our pants today. Uh, I'm human. I make mistakes. And I'm trying to fix that thumbnail right now. That doesn't mean we don't have a banger of a show. We always have a banger of, the sh of a show. And uh, despite adversity, I promise you guys that I will figure it out. We will win ball games, and we will face the robot takeover of Chipotle together. And it's not just Chipotle. I could have done White Castle as well, but seeing as uh, White Castle in many ways isn't really around anyway... Well, you know, I'll fix that one uh, last. But I wanted to start with this story. We're also going to be talking about a corrupt FBI and how the system uh, really works, how these war of terror, okay, the wars of terror are created. And uh, really, most people want to believe that we're not that far gone that the FBI is not totally and completely beholden to a system of corruption. It is. They don't want to believe that a lot of jobs really are not going to be around in five to ten years. They're not. They're on their way out. Okay? They're on their way. Uh, bye bye Rise of the restaurant robots. Chipotle and White Castle are spending over 500000 thousand dollars a month five hundred thousand dollars a month on automation to combat labor shortages and rising food costs but it is still cheaper than paying human workers you're on your way out they're automating you out of everything this is not an accident this is actually something that they announced when i say they uh chipotle in particular about two years ago uh, two years ago, they said, look, it's time to bring in the robots. We love the robots. The robots are great. And look, you know, if the robots are going to be doing something, probably uh, serving human beings food, not the worst thing. But this shows you uh, the continuation uh, of us losing large sections of the economy for American citizens. And what do I mean by that? Well, so many people, 10, 15 years ago, the mantra when you still called, quote unquote, migrants, illegal immigrants, remember when the, when that was terminology, they would tell you, oh no, they're, they're doing the work nobody else wants to do. Do you want to do that work, Jason? Do you want to do the manual labor? Do you want to do the yard work and the cleaning? And I would always say, and you go back 10, 15 years when I was talking about this, the vast majority of those jobs 
were youth driven and neighborhood driven and community driven. And it was something for people who did not have the traditional after school or part time job coming up could do. And it would build character. And those people did want to do that job and that they liked having money and setting goals and it prepared them better for when they got out into the world and society and actually had to take jobs. Nope. Nope. Instead, a generation of what? Learned helplessness came in. Okay. A generation that expected instant gratification. A generation that didn't just want a trophy for participation. They wanted to pay for work they either didn't do or weren't good at. Or weren't even good at. And we see it again and again and again. And meanwhile, the people at the top, the ones that had infiltrated the education systems and aided this, are sitting there laughing and snickering because the future doesn't need us. Okay? Meet Chippy, Chipotle's robotic kitchen assistant. And Chippy, here. This is, uh, again... Oh, this is from uh, March of, of 2022. Chipotle goes automated. But I remember seeing um, stories. Is, is this a, a video story? Yeah, let's watch it now. Uh, up to two years ago on this. Let's see what we got. Are we going to get a commercial from CNBC? Chipotle is getting a little help in the kitchen from Chippy. The robot from Miso Robotics is an autonomous kitchen assistant tasked with making one of the company's signature menu items, chips. Via AI, it's trained to make the exact recipe, including with salt and a hint of lime. Chief Technology Officer Kurt Garner told me this was about making things more fluid for restaurants, particularly during peak times. We started the idea around how could we use technology and artificial intelligence to be a better predictor of when we might run out of chips and find better ways or times throughout the day to make them, uh, but then started thinking more broadly about ways that we might automate some of the more mundane and re repetitive parts uh, of chip making and provide a better tool for our restaurant teams. Just so everybody knows, the vast majority of what you're going to do in a kitchen other than it being high space or a high paced and very on demand, it's gonna be mundane and boring. It's gonna be the same thing again and again and again and again. No, you wanna save on labor costs. You want a bigger profit. That's what automation's really for. Chippy is being tested at the Chipotle Cultivate Center. That's the company's innovation hub in Irvine, California. And it'll be used in a restaurant in Southern California later this year. The company is relying on the stage gate process it uses for new menu items to test and learn from workers and guests before deciding whether it should move ahead with a national rollout of Chippy. The company also said it's not looking to solve for a labor shortage with the robot, even as the great resignation continues to impact the broader sector. We didn't approach this from a lens of trying to solve for a labor problem. We approached it from a lens of what would make it easier, more fun, more rewarding in a restaurant? How do we take more fun and reward? That's what they're so they're not worried about the quote unquote great resignation, which isn't real either, by the way. That's 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 not a real thing. The great resignation. It's Johnny nonsense, everybody. That's what it is. There's no great resignation. You set up a system where you inflated the economy and incentivized people not to work. You taught a generation learned helplessness. And now almost 10% of men who are of working age and able to work don't even want to work. They never resigned from anything because they never worked for anything. This is, again, by design away some of the tasks that team members don't like and give them more time to focus on the tasks that they do, uh, like preparing food and serving guests. The idea is for Chipotle to continue to lead on technology, Garner said, mentioning dishwashing as another place where automation could come in handy in the future, along with leveraging new technologies and ways to run its digital kitchens. Digital sales made up 41.6% of the company's total sales last quarter and is a very important part of the growing business. I'm Kate Rogers. CNBC and again, this is not stopping. It is going to advance. It is coming. This is the next step. 
learned helplessness, universal basic incomes, and inflation so that even if you do have work, you are working hard, your money no longer lasts as long or has the same type of purchasing power. So please take our universal basic slave income. Okay, I want to shift gears a little bit. There was a film, I don't even remember the title of it, out a couple years ago, where they were kind of mocking the Federal Bureau of Investigation and its system of quote-unquote catching terrorists. Because guess what, folks? They don't catch terrorists. They make terrorists. The FBI is the number one purveyor of recruiting terrorists. And uh, this is an interview with the... uh, I believe it's the the writer-director of the film talking about the absurdity of the FBI, seeing as the FBI is absolutely a criminal organization and the January 6th trials are starting. And, you know, I conversation with my girlfriend last night. It's rigged, man. I know I had Randy Ireland on yesterday, and he was trying to put a smile on and a happy face and and, and looking like, uh, you know, there's some positivity in this. There is none. I'm sorry. I, I, w- I wish there was positivity other than maybe waking some more people up, which I think is going to be tough to do with the narrative that's out there, by the way. No, there, there's nothing positive. We have an FBI that is a criminal organization. So we're also going to play a clip of Trump back in the day talking about how uh, Mueller and the FBI should accept the invitation, okay, accept the invitation of old Poot Poot and go and investigate on behalf of old Poot Poot whether or not the Ruskies, you know, the ones that were supposedly uh, padding Trump's bank account, that we now know that's also fiction, right? Poot Poot said, hey, if you think we, we hacked the election or hacked some sort, come on in, come investigate. Mueller and the gang uh, had no desire to do that. So uh, let's play this clip where uh, this gentleman in the entertainment industry expertly breaks down what the FBI is really all about. Is one, who is the biggest recruiter of terrorists in the USA? And two, what would you do if you were broke, about to lose your house, and someone offered you 100 grand? And that's really the the answer to the first question is rather surprisingly the biggest recruiter of terrorists in the states is the fbi Mm -hmm. and the answer to the second one gives you the clue as to how our story works because the fbi have accidentally it seems developed a system which works rather well and the system is they make up a terrorist plot they find someone to try and carry it out and they arrest them for doing that and then get the kudos for having fought the Great war against terrorists. Well, they get they they get all sorts of things, really. I mean, it's quite complicated. But I guess the essential element of our story is that these people are not terrorists, but the government ends up putting them in jail for very as long. If terms. they were, yes, 25, 30 years, and there's a close to 100 percent conviction rate in these cases. And I wasn't looking for this. I wasn't aware of this. I mean, I think we all sort of have a vague idea that the FBI may may be involved in setting people up. But then when you follow the story that I did and you see it close up, it's jaw-dropping. It's really shocking and very, very hard to believe. Um, Not hard to believe if you have followed the trail of corruption since pre-9-11 and especially the... Uh, 1993 bombing, which I highlight in Invisible Empire, A New World Order Defined, and the FBI recruited somebody to build the bomb that went off and killed eight people. And had it been parked in the correct place by the Patsies, would have killed a whole lot more. And if you think 9-11 was a tragedy of 3,000 people, why don't you envision a fully packed World Trade Center with 15,000 to 30,000 people inside, toppling from the bottom into New York City onto not a sparse, but a heavy and dense population. You could have been looking at, again, anywhere from 20 to 40,000 deaths like that. Like that. Over 10 times the damage of 9-11 much earlier. Can you imagine what uh, what these monsters would have done? Look at how they capitalized 
on Oklahoma City. And then look how they really capitalized on 9-11. Had the 93 bombing gone their way, things could have been out of control. Uh, and yet the <laughs> statistics, once you lay them out, are, are quite extraordinary. I mean, uh, we're talking about 100 incidents of the FBI doing this, 100 known incidents. More, and actually, more. Yes, I mean, I say it's based on 100 true stories. That's yeah. a sort of notional 100. It's in the right ballpark. It's more likely 300. But 300 times uh, the, the FBI have managed to pin a crime on essentially innocent people who were just part of some casual grouping, who they trained to be terrorists and then arrested and jailed. Yes, if I may take the FBI's side for a second, it sort of works like this. You're freaked out by 9-11. You have to cover yourself because you're implicated in some of the sloppy procedures that led to 9-11. So you talk the threat up. You say there's a sleeper cell in every city, and then you go and find it. Now, you don't know what you're looking for. And classically in the FBI, you talk about other people. You other. You look at brown and black people because they are more likely, you think, to be a problem. And if somebody sticks their head up in one of those communities, then you surround them with false friends, informants, who will offer them money and friendship to try and lure them along a sort of carefully scripted program of self-incrimination. And by the way, you know, he, he does correctly, at least in the initial stages of the war on terror, you know, Muslims in many cases were the scapegoats. That's over. That's over. Now it's the white folks, right? It's the constitutionalists. And and really, they set up the infrastructure that way from the beginning, but knew that more people would accept it if, again, it was associated with Middle Eastern terrorism, all right, people that didn't look like them. Uh, they wouldn't go into looking at how they were set up. They would just accept the narrative. But now that narrative is changing and with their uh, real-time censorship that's still around big tech all over the place, they brought in the idea of not only, you know, uh, white supremacy and terrorism, but now insurrection. And especially when we're looking at January 6th, the idea that you go to a rally, you may or may not have broken some laws that doesn't really uh, seem to matter in this case. And instead of just charging you with the crimes on the books, you're a terrorist. Which results in that person going to jail. And you will say to the court as a prosecutor, is it better that this person goes to jail or that we let them go back out on the street? And the juries always say, better put them in jail. I mean, in, the, in real life, what happened was that there was a story on British TV news about the, supposedly the biggest plot since 9-11, about an army planning to launch a full ground war on the US based in Miami. And it turned out three years later, I bumped into somebody involved in the trial who said that ground war was actually seven construction workers who were going to ride into Chicago on horses. This was not a really serious terrorist plot. They had just been wound up by an FBI informant. They had no money. The informant was offering a lot of cash. And so they riffed a crazy scheme to try and get this guy out of money, to try and take money off this guy. So that true story and loads of others informed the story within the film, which, yes, these, in that case, in the Liberty City 7 case, which was the, the guys with the horses, um, s six out of seven of them were Haitian Catholics. Well, as a journalist, having watched it, obviously my immediate reaction was to go and look up the figures, try and see what else I could find. And it is incredible that this has happened on such a scale. And you begin to look at American justice and say, how has so revered a system as, as it is in America itself come up with an incapacity to spot the charade that's being put before them. I just think there's no will to examine it. I mean, I think that once George Bush said, you're either for us or against us, there was a kind of division in American society between us and them, which had always been there, but it was somehow legitimized by the government. And the FBI acted on that same impulse. If you think of that George Bush statement, for us or against us, you legitimize a divide in society right there. Now, Donald Trump comes in 16 years later and exploits that divide. It's not the only thing. There's all sorts of other kind of destabilizers involved. But I think that once you polarize society that way, and it sort of happened with us after 9-11, that there was this kind of sudden, suddenly you've got a new other. 
And it seems to me that the thing to ridicule is that tendency. For example, if you look at Trump, suddenly the FBI were momentarily the good guys because they might bring him down. No, they're never good guys. And, but his, his technique fooled everyone into sort of a moment's mistake. Oh, suddenly the FBI are the good No, I mean, it's like with Nixon. The FBI instigated the Watergate inquiry. It didn't make them the good guys then. They were up to their necks in COINTEL Pro. So Trump's move is to confuse people, yes, but you've got to stick to what's actually happening. And I think that, yeah, you need to take notes pretty fast right now, but I don't think he's escaped ridicule. I mean, he is self-ridiculing, but you're always going to be able to ridicule someone like that. Yeah, absolutely. Guy, a guy nailed it. He talked about COINTEL Pro. And here is Trump, uh, you know, talking about uh, what Mueller could have done again, but it was never a real probe. It was all about this narrative of Russia, 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 Russia. The lead up to the summit, you actually tweeted out if you were given the great city of Moscow for retribution for all the sins, et cetera, of, of Russia, the media would be asking why you didn't get St. Petersburg as well. I said that. I said, if I got Moscow as, a, uh, as part of a deal, they said, here's Moscow. Please, please pardon us. Uh, that soccer ball was really very nice. I have to say it was very nice. You know, they and by the way, look how much Trump has aged since just this interview right here. Presidency takes it out of you, man. Especially if you're on the last legs of your life. You're in that twilight. You're in that, uh, you know, uh, third portion, that third act. I mean, I, Trump doesn't even look like the same person here. He did a great job in, in running that. But it is true. You know, I said, if I got Moscow, they'd want St. Petersburg or they'd want more. So the media was a very unfair. I never thought this was when I said this is foolproof. I raised 44 billion and the secretary general said he raised 44 billion and it was only President Trump because I said, well, otherwise, we're going to have to start thinking about our relationship to NATO. I also said this NATO is wonderful, but it helps Europe a lot more than it helps us. NATO is not wonderful, Mr. Trump. And again, it is really the vehicle for a global military and the Great Reset agenda. And asking why we're even a part of NATO post-Cold War was the correct thing and not placating to the idea that we need to keep it. And yet we're paying for 90% of it. So uh, I was amazed that the most of the media, you didn't, and some others didn't, but much of the media said that I was uh, tough, very tough and nasty to foreign leaders. And I really wasn't at all, but I did say you have to pay up. Well, you talked about Europe as a foe. You talked about Vladimir Putin as a foe and you clarified that means a competitor. Similarly, the media is upset, you say, an enemy of the people. Aren't you really saying that they're not doing their job? And well, when I say enemy of the people, I'm not talking about all the media. I'm talking about there is a big percentage of media. When you look at CNN, how false their reports are. When you look at NBC and some of the others, when you read the New York Times, it's just story after story after story. That's uh, just a negative spin. And we're doing great things. We have the greatest economy in the history of our country. We have the Crushed. best unemployment numbers in the history of our country. Over. Best African-American unemployment numbers in history. Hispanic numbers in history, women's numbers in history. States are you know, I, again, shouldn't have played into the identity politics, Donnie. It's just what they want you to do. Records. I think it'll get there. But the more amazing thing, too, is we have more jobs available than we actually have people on unemployment. First and one time. Of, First and time. the labor participation rate in the country has never been higher. First time. Let me go back because uh, everybody in the media is so focused on this. In 2014, in the Washington Times, Devin Nunes said with a certainty that Russia would try to impact the 2016 elections. Barack Obama, in the month before the 2016 elections, and I will read and I will quote, no serious per person out there would suggest that somehow you could even rig America's elections. No evidence that it has happened in the past, which is not true, and number two, or that it could happen in this election. And I invite Mr. Trump to stop whining and to go out there and try and get votes. He would say that two weeks before the election. Well, he we thought Hillary Clinton was going to win and he didn't want to do anything to disturb it. And, you know, frankly, when I won, he said, this is the biggest deal. 
But before I won, he said, this is nothing and it can't happen. It's a very dishonest deal. And, you know, you have to find out who did Peter Strzok report to, because it was Comey and it was McKay, but it was also probably Obama. Uh, if you think that Obama didn't know what was going, when you watch, and I said it today with President Putin, when you watch Peter Strzok's performance, the lover of Lisa Page, when you watch that performance, the FBI, I'll tell you, I know so many people in the FBI. These are incredible people. What they have to, what they're going through watching this guy, a total phony. I mean, how about uh, we'll stop it? Here's the deal. That's who gets elevated. The guys like Peter Strzok. That guy. You know, the guy cheating on his wife with his partner. The guy who actually went to look into Seth Rich and proved beyond any reasonable doubt after the fact that, of course, the FBI had files on Seth Rich that they were lying about, that they would lie about continuously before this. And quickly note in the Mueller report where, again, they inverted reality and acted like Assange and WikiLeaks put out a conspiracy theory regarding Seth Rich why to cover up the ties with Russia, Russia, Russia that they could never prove. Or something to that no, effect. He said, we will stop you. Yeah, well. We'll stop him. And then. Insurance And policy. he said, originally, I guess it was the two of them. No. Then he said the next day, well, I meant the American people. And even the Democrats say, that doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, no. Reports, no. Lisa Page contradicted him and gave a more honest assessment. I heard she did much better than he did. And she was honest and took a lot of hard shots. But at least she was honest about it. Uh, he's a disgrace to our country. He's a disgrace to the great FBI, a disgrace. And how he's still being paid is beyond belief. Not only being paid, but then promoted by these monsters, allowed to set up, I believe, he got to go with a GoFundMe that got like a quarter million dollars. You see, GoFundMe and other large payment systems and payment processors, they'll do what? They'll go after American citizens or Canadian truckers and stop them from raising money. But... A uh, corrupt, active member of the media military industrial complex that is doing the bidding of a predator class make as much money as possible. Open it right up for him. Did you like President Putin's idea? Robert Mueller should go talk to him. Because I, I was I was fascinated by it. So they have a treaty where they work together with the United States, because everyone said we don't have an extradition treaty, but they have a treaty where they work together, and his prosecutors would prosecute it, and he said that Robert Mueller's people could go with them, but they probably won't want to. Yeah, interesting. Let me ask you. The 13 angry Democrats, you think they're going to want to go? I don't think so. Um, and, of course, his pit bull, Andrew Weissman, who I think has a pretty atrocious record that we have found. It's very sad what's happening to our country because of this. We have. We've never done better in so many ways, including economically. But when you see this thing going on, and I will tell you, it's driven a wedge between us and Russia. Maybe we've just knocked down that wedge, but it has driven a wedge. And President Putin said that. One of the early things he said when we started, he said, it's really a shame because we could do so much good, whether it's humanitarian aid throughout the Middle East, whether it's not just Syria. Uh, so many different things. The safety of nuclear, which is ultimately, there's nothing bigger, nothing more important. And one of the reasons I played this is because look at how far we've gone. Now Russia's the full-fledged enemy again. And uh, yesterday, I was substitute hosting on uh, Making Sense of the Madness. I was, well, I was supposed to get um, this whistleblower named uh, John Christmas. I'm not kidding. Yes, John Christmas. And uh, I guess he is the inspiration for KGB Banker. And it was going to go into the criminality aspects of Poot Poot, the KGB, the FSB, the alliances um, with the mafia there. And I think that that's something that people need to realize. I'm not a Russophile. I realize the corruption is big time over there, that Putin isn't the best guy. But Again, that's the type of corruption we need to be focusing on, not the imagination corruption where the Russians are hacking our election or backing Donald Trump. That's not real. That's not real at all. So 
what I want to do here is I want to go to my film, Invisible Empire, A New World Order Defined. And in particular, I want to bring up this FBI section that goes beyond Iran-Contra and the deep state and the drug dealing and the National Programs Office and into an era of total and complete corruption. Now, we could start with the 93 bombing, but this time around, I want to start with um, Oklahoma City and then have it lead into the FBI bombing because I think it's really important that we understand, you know, uh, when we talk about the first World Trade Center bombing, it precedes OKC. But OKC has that white supremacy flavor, right? Elahome City, the whole nine. And it's all part of the same thing. So let's cut to this. And this is um, the Oklahoma City into the World Trade Center 93 section, Invisible Empire, a new world order defined. Still believe that Timothy McVeigh was a right-wing extremist who bombed the Oklahoma City building with a rider truck because he was upset with the government. People close to the event told a very different story. A local congressman believes that convicted bomber Timothy McVeigh and his accused co-conspirator Terry Nichols are not the only ones involved. The Oklahoma State Representative Charles Key produced a videotape featuring witnesses who claimed to have seen Timothy McVeigh with another man the morning of the bombing. He was wearing a ball cap. Timothy McVeigh had his on backwards, which is just like this. It was on his head. The other gentleman had his on like this. In fact, the FBI had actively pursued John Doe number two in its initial investigation, then denied his existence altogether. There were also multiple reports that explosives were found inside the Murrah building. Now, the Justice Department is reporting that a second explosive device has been found in the AP Murrah uh, building in downtown Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, you're still with us, aren't you? Yes, I am. And I, and I might tell you, in addition to that, that in fact, what we were told at the scene a few minutes ago was that, in fact, two different explosive devices were found in addition to the one that went off. The second explosive was found and diffused. The third explosive that was found, and they are working on right now as we speak, I understand, both the second and third explosives, if you can imagine this, were larger than the first. Bomb squads were actually caught on video pulling into the building to retrieve these devices. They'll back that trailer down there, and the uh, bomb squad folks will go in, and they will use that, uh, that trailer. You see the, the bucket on the back there, sort of, this is how they would transport the explosive device away from this populated area to try to do something with it. Well, I just took a look down the street uh, at the Mara building again. I see another bomb truck going, so apparently they're going to try to get out that third bomb that's been talked about. This was even confirmed by the governor at the time, Frank Keating. One device was... Uh, was uh, deactivated. Apparently there's another device, and obviously whatever did the damage to the Murrah building was a tremendous, uh, very sophisticated explosive device. Members of the ATF who would have normally been in the building were tipped off prior to the bombing. He saw what appeared to be a police bomb squad truck near the Murrah building two hours before the blast. It had a shield on the side of the door, and it said bomb disposal or bomb squad blow it, and I really found that interesting. Another witness who spoke to ABC News on the condition of anonymity will tell the grand jury tomorrow he was told by an ATF official agents working in the building had been warned in advance not to come to work. He just came out and told me that the ATF wasn't in the building that day. They'd been tipped by their pagers not to come to work, uh, which I was, flabber I was flabbergasted. McVeigh would even claim in a letter written to his sister which was published by the New York Times, that he was actually recruited for black operations, which included smuggling drugs into the United States, as well as assassinations. One may brush this off as the ravings of a madman. However, McVeigh was filmed at the Camp Grafton Military Facility in North Dakota on August 3rd, 1993. McVeigh's official records state that he was discharged over a year prior from the Army Reserve in May of 1992. Perhaps even more interesting, is that Camp Grafton was specializing in training troops in explosives and demolitions at the time. When all was said and done, the security tapes reported to have captured the entire thing on video were rounded up and classified. In 2009, they were finally released, and magically none of them caught the bombing. The excuse being they were all having their tapes changed at that exact moment. This event would be labeled domestic extremism, which was used to demonize critics of world government, militias, 
and create fear within the populace. Muslim extremism seemed to show its ugly face in then unprecedented fashion on February 26, 1993. So, so again, you got the white supremacy, 1995, you clearly got a corrupt Justice Department, a corrupt uh, FBI, a corrupt ATF at the highest levels, right? And then you have an incident like this in New York City that really could have been the original 9-11. A truck bomb had gone off in the parking area of the World Trade Center. Luckily, the bombers failed to follow instructions and parked the truck carrying the explosives against the main support column. What is not discussed, however, is the bomb was actually built by an FBI informant under the supervision of the FBI. Ahmed Salam, a former Egyptian army officer who had been doing undercover work for the FBI, was the man who actually built the bomb. When he was told that he would have to use real bomb-making material instead of harmless substitutes, he became suspicious and began taping his conversations with FBI officials. Last winter, the FBI was praised for its speed in cracking the case of the World Trade Center bombing and bringing four suspects to trial. Now, there is some evidence that the FBI may have known of the plot in advance through an informant and might, might even have stopped the bombing that killed six people. Notice the media emphasizes that they might have been able to stop it. They then gloss over the fact that the bomb was built by their agent under FBI supervision in conjunction with the district attorney. FBI agents might have been able to prevent last February's deadly explosion at New York's World Trade Center. They discussed secretly substituting harmless powder for the explosives, but they didn't, according to the FBI's own informant, Imad Salem. Unbeknownst to the FBI at the time, Salem recorded many of his conversations with his handlers. The actual recording where Salam discusses this with his FBI handler, John Antisev, was released years after the trial. You got paid regularly for, for good information. I mean, the expenses were a little bit out of the ordinary, and it was really questioned. Don't tell Nancy I told you this. But well, I have to tell her, of course. Well, then if you have to, you have to. Yeah, because, I mean, the lady was being honest, and I was being honest, and everything was submitted with a receipt. Yeah. Right. And now it's questionable. It's not questionable. It's like a little out of ordinary. Okay. You know. I don't think it was. If that's what you think, guys, fine. But I don't think that because we was start already building the bomb, which is went off in the World Trade Center. It was built by uh, uh, supervising uh, supervision from the bureau and the GA, and we was all informed about it. And we know that the bomb start to be built by who? By your confidential informant. What a wonderful, great case. Hey, Jason, you're muted. Thank you so much. Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> oh, boy, it's a morning. So, once again, you, you look at this stuff, and you look at 9-11, and uh, the FBI is integral. Yes, we are muted. Thank you for everybody on there, <laughs> guys. And in numerous aspects of 9-11... It's not that the FBI doesn't know what they're doing. They're the cover-up crew, right? They've got some of the quote-unquote hijackers living with them in the FBI. Their investigation into what happened at the Pentagon, clearly a cover-up. Clearly, we never got the actual surveillance videos. All right, we got some frames and then can be debated on forever. And then if you dare to question what actually hit the Pentagon, oh, you're a bad person. If you dare to question what may or may not have happened over in Shanksville, you're a bad person. And I've got a small clip uh, from Loose Change here. 
uh, that does just that. Well, Darren, in the last hour or so, the FBI and the state police here have confirmed that they have cordoned off a second area about six to eight miles away from the crater here where this plane went down. This is apparently another debris site, which raises a number of questions. Why would debris from the plane, and they identified it specifically as being from this plane, why would debris be located six miles away? Could it have blown that far away? Seems highly unlikely. Almost all the debris found at this site is within 100 yards, 200 yards away. So it raises some questions. We don't want to over speculate, of course. It seems to me from covering a number of plane crashes on on the scene that if nothing else, you can say this is not typical for a plane crash to be spread across an area this large. It certainly doesn't make sense because most of the, the debris has been found in a very compact area within 100 yards, 200 yards, maybe a little beyond that. And then all of a sudden they're telling us six miles away, they have another concentration of debris. They say it's very small pieces. Most of these are very small pieces. Most of the pieces here are no bigger than the size of a briefcase, they say. Mm -hmm. And the pieces six miles away may be even smaller than that. And when we're talking about this, this is uh, Flight 93, I want people to understand, you know, we're not talking about Indian Lake, which is really like a mile and a half, two miles away. We're talking about New Baltimore over a mountain ridge. Ask yourself, how in the world could a plane crash on the ground put debris six to eight miles away over a mountain ridge? Did they find a plane in Shanksville? within the last hour. I want to get qu uh, quickly to Chris Kanicki. He was back there just a couple of minutes ago. And Chris, I've seen the pictures. It looks like there's nothing there except for a hole in the ground. Uh, basically, that's right. The only thing you could see from where we were uh, was a big gouge in the earth and some broken trees. From where we could see, there wasn't much left. Any large pieces of debris at all? No, there was nothing, nothing that you could distinguish that a plane had crashed there. Smoke, fire? Nothing. It was absolutely quiet. It was uh, actually very quiet. Um, nothing going on down there. No smoke, no fire. Just a couple of people walking around. They look like part of the NTSB crew walking around looking at the pieces. How big would you say that hole was? Uh, from my estimates, I would guess it was probably about 20 to 15 feet uh, long and probably about 10 feet long or 10 feet wide. What could you see on the ground, if anything, other than dirt and ash? and? You couldn't see anything. You could just see dirt, ash, and people walking around, broken trees. From the Somerset County corner to the mayor of Shanksville, almost every eyewitness would remark how little of the plane and its passengers remained. And let me say this. I think it was last anniversary. I played clips of FBI agents 15 plus years later saying when they got there, they didn't even know a plane crash had occurred. I remember the coroner came out swinging, swinging at the loose change crew for daring to quote him. And he uh, was on some anniversary special talking about going into the woods and seeing like melted plastic coming off the trees, but has never, never said there were any bodies there. Basically said, hey, there were no bodies. So I really didn't have a job to do. But when I got there, you know, I wondered to myself, where is it? You know, there was just, the plane was just totally disintegrated. The only thing we didn't see were people. Nothing uh, to indicate that, uh, that there was even anybody on the plane. I remember asking a state trooper that was there to be sure, is that where the plane went down? It was so hard to tell because there was nothing around. So hard to tell because there was nothing around. But no, the FBI is not the cover-up crew. Let's see. FBI comments on United 93 on anniversary. Let's see if we can pull up that video. I have it somewhere, obviously downloaded, but we'll do it live. Let's see if Google I or Googly can help us here. Um, let's see. Uh... Investigators tell of emotions associated with the United 93 crash. That's 2012. That's 2009. Let's see if I can find it. Um, that's with a tweet. That's 2021. Oh, let's see. Be the next hero. The investigation of United 93. Gee, I don't know. Maybe, maybe this is uh, it. It is the FBI. I think this might be it, folks. Let me see. This is it. All right. Great. <laughs> 
because it's, it's like 15 minutes long. This is officially what the FBI put out. Look at that. Uh, six years ago. So I'm not going insane. I've actually got my dates down. Well, let's hear what they have to say here, folks. I had an assignment to report to the Pittsburgh office that morning. Happened to be listening to the radio. They had a report of a plane hitting the World Trade Center. I thought, wow, I wonder, you know, boy, a mishap of a plane going to one of the airports or, you know, didn't, you know, strike me as terror at that time. I just didn't know what was going on. Of course, everybody remembers that, that first tower scene with the smoke. So we're kind of in and out. And then, then of course, the second plane hits. Just about everybody in the office, I think, had crowded into the break room at that time. And uh, everyone was, you know, obviously concerned as to what was going on. Then there was a report about the Pentagon. Initially, we were thinking, because I was on the evidence response team, that we would probably be going to New York to help there. And then when the plane hit the Pentagon, we weren't sure which location we'd end up at. We then got a call about another plane potentially coming our way that was in distress. They believed that it was coming from Cleveland and that it may need to land, crash land at our airport here in Johnstown. Now it was that this may be deliberate, that it may be acts of terrorism. It would potentially be a crime scene in our jurisdiction. Before we got to the airport though, we were told though that divert from there that a plane had crashed in Shanksville. And I just remember thinking, that's our territory, that's our squad. We're going to be heading out there. So I got back to my car and started out of the city as, as quickly as I could. Now, what, watch the intro. Everybody, you know, very aware of what was going on that day. Totally remembering it, recalling it calmly within the office. Listen to what they say next. Be the next hero. Bum, bum, bum the investigation of United 93. Yeah, okay. The cover-up of 93. I think we finally arrived out of the scene between 2 and 3 o'clock that afternoon. The plane crashed shortly after 10 a.m. So we had uh, an RA out near that site, and they responded initially. We would have been the first because it's 20 minutes from the uh, office as, as we drove that day. I expected to see fuselage, uh, remnants of a plane, which I didn't see anything but pretty much smoke and some fires. No fuselage, no remnants of a plane, just smoke and fire. Okay. I saw absolutely no signs that an airplane was present no matter what direction I looked. Uh, and no matter what direction I looked, there was no plane. Forget about a fuselage wing parts. I mean, everywhere I looked, there's no plane. You didn't know that a plane had crashed there. You had a crater, and the initial crater was probably 15 feet deep, but we didn't have big plane parts laying everywhere. Okay, so that's three people. All there, aside from the other people we just showed you saying there's no plane there. This is the great magic trick, all right? And then what'll happen is... Uh, these people that love to attack, they got nothing going on in their lives. I mean, nothing. I mean, I can't imagine how pathetic some of the personal lives of some of the people that have attacked me over the years for pointing this out are. But uh, to this day, anonymous loser trolls, that's what you are if you're watching this, anonymous loser trolls that won't put their face to anything whatsoever promote these other trolls that want to be looked up to in the quote-unquote 9-11 truth movement. And they want to attack people like me and Richard Gage and Alex Jones for daring to question things like what you're just seeing there. And I'm the bad guy because I don't engage with losers. Okay, I'll debate anybody in a forum. That's not what this is about. But what happens is you have... Uh, these people that want to be pushed to the top of the quote-unquote 9-11 truth movement. And those same people won't only attack you for stuff like this. They won't acknowledge that Building 7 is a controlled demolition, which is completely obvious. So what are they really there for? What are they really there for? They're there 
to sow discord within the movement so it can never gain the type of traction that it needs. And they're there to mock people that have done way more than they'll ever do and are actually working on behalf of humanity to expose this information. They're, they're the real gatekeepers, okay? And, and the people that jump into, um, you know, the live streams or my Twitter feed and promote these people, God, how pathetic are you? You know, they're the same people that'll shoot some bullshit out, okay? Just put out whatever they want, shoot out some bullshit, and then, now Burmese is going to ban me. You're an anonymous loser of count. Of course I'm going to ban you. I don't, I don't feed the trolls. Yeah, I'm going to block you. You're, you're in here, and you're commenting on stories that have nothing to do with 9-11, have no context, but you're promoting your loser. Okay? Because I dare to point out FBI agents to this day coming out and saying, Oh, when we got there, we expect to see a plane. Didn't see any plane. Didn't see any plane at all. Normal. <laughs> we should just accept that, right? We should just accept the robots automating us out on behalf of an anti-human predator class agenda. They're not here to empower us, folks. They're here to enslave us. And, you know, I've got two um, videos of Bushnell that I don't often go over, at least not in full. I've played little clips of. And one over, one of them is called uh, Taking Over What Will Humans Do in the Future? Okay, and this is where he's extremely long-winded. It's a 30-minute uh, show, but at the end he tells you they become us, we become them, or you have what? Human-contaminated machines. And on the way to that, you have a system, if you're lucky, of a universal basic income where the robots provide the wealth for the rest of us. Okay? That's the head of NASA telling you about that automation. And yeah, it might start with some Chipotle and Chippy. And it might start with some Domino's and their automated driver delivery system where a robot comes off the back and gives you your hot pizza that was cooked on a conveyor belt by a machine. But that's far, far from the end of this. So um, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play just the beginning of this Bushnell clip with this, uh, this futurist woman uh, that he's had many talks with uh, on the robot takeover. the night. I'm Hazel Henderson. Welcome to Ethical Markets. Since the 1960s, we have seen machines taking over production lines and the jobs of cashiers, telephone operators, later legal assistants, accountants, and now performing medical diagnoses often better than doctors. Google owns nine military robot companies. This shift to automation is now accelerating as Silicon Valley startups manage our social lives via Facebook, Match.com, and eHarmony. The radical efficiency of these digital firms is now taking over not only retailing, news, entertainment, manufacturing, and education, but also formerly safe white-collar jobs even automating finance and stock trading with robo-advisory firms like Betterment. Driverless vehicles will end the jobs of millions of taxi and truck drivers and that rite of passage for millions of teenagers in learning how to drive. I think that that's important because one of the things they want to get you on is not just their eco... Um, electric car system because they're trying to save the planet and they do want to uh, manage you know where you can go and how you can get there but they don't want you driving all right they don't want you driving at all that's why everything has to be autonomous so they can implement this system and that's what 5g really is has nothing to do with better speeds on your phone that's imagination land that's not real okay and by the way taxi driver thank you so much for the tip over at the Rockfin. No, 
They're getting ready to get rid of your purpose on the planet. All right. And if the if the robots were really going to create wealth for the rest of us and a higher standard of living, great. Not what they're here to do. The rite of passage to learn to drive. It's kind of weird for me here because in Iowa, you can uh, begin the process of driving and getting your license at 14. My niece, uh, my nieces are 12 and 13, and boy, the 13 year old can't wait to become 14. And I'm just like, I, I'm, I could have waited until she was 16 to start driving, is all I can say, guys. Economists always promise new jobs in new sectors, but this time it's different. What happens to humans as all these jobs disappear? We see the de-skilling, for example, of airline pilots who are less able to take over if their computer systems malfunction. Several accidents have been the result. The fundamental issue is how will human workers compete? Will retraining programs up upgrade skills sufficiently? Or are we seeing the end of work as a means of earning a living? As we discussed with futurist Jeremy Rifkin in our earlier show on the future of work. Already inequality has become an urgent issue in the USA and Europe with wages stagnant for 30 years. How will advanced automated economies maintain general demand and purchasing power? so that consumers can buy the cornucopia of goods being produced. I and other futurists have been debating these issues since the 1960s when we welcomed automation. We expected it would take over dangerous jobs and allow even shorter work weeks and growing leisure sectors, travel, entertainment, flourishing arts, innovation and personal development. Never happened personal development, more vacation time. No, it turned in, uh, into a society where both people in the relationship, the man and the woman, the husband and the wife had to work full time. It went from a system of savings and earnings to a system of credit and debt and smaller households, smaller families, a lower standard of living, less vacation time, longer work weeks. That's what actually happened. That's the reality. We explored how basic minimum incomes proposed by Milton Friedman as the negative income tax could underpin this shift. Employee ownership of companies has spread to over 11,000 firms so that when machines take jobs, workers can now own pieces of those machines. Today, all these issues are back on the table. And, and by the way, that sounds a lot like the idea of stakeholder capitalism that Klaus and the guys are going to sell you on. Oh, stakeholder capitalism is coming. You're going to own a part. No, you're not. That's bullshit. That's setting up the have everythings and the have nothings. And we played the clip yesterday. You know, the World Economic Forum might tell you you're going to own nothing and be happy. Well, I got news for you. Um, the eugenicists out there, the population control people, are like, yeah, you know, we, we could maybe have 8, 9 billion people on the planet, but we need a really smart dictatorship. And by the way, your standard of living is going to plummet. Somehow we want to peacefully get down to like 1 billion, maybe 2, and then maybe you can have a decent standard of living. That's what they're talking about. All right, folks. The first hour is about to wrap up. I'm going to give the cue to the producers to try to make that transition right now. I want to remind everybody, if you are watching on YouTube, to thumbs it up, subscribe and share. Check out all the documentary films, including Invisible Empire and Loose Change Final Cut, of which you just saw a little sample pack of. We've also got some other great movies out there, like Fabled Enemies and Shade the Motion Picture, all of which I'm extremely proud of and are free of charge. I would like you to share with others. We're on BitChute. We're on Band.TV. You can come on over free and listen to the rest of the broadcast over at the InfoWarrior.Podbean.com. But if you want to see 
um, this lovely lady's face. You want to see Bushnell as he goes, ah, and ah, and ah, over the next <laughs> several minutes to an hour. Make that premium account over at redvoicemedia.com slash Jason. Use the affiliate link to sign up. Lock it in right now for 50 cents uh, for the first week. Just try it out. Then it's 10 bucks a month, or you can lock it in for the entire year at $100. Save yourself two months. I highly recommend it. With that being said, Rockfin, we will see you on the flip side. YouTube, real as always. Keep being that Trojan.